Well, if you uh, want to follow along in your Bible, we're going to be looking at the first uh, 10 verses of Ephesians chapter 2, page 1226. And uh, so if you want to follow along, have those in front of you. Um, uh, I'm I'm pretty sure Harry won't mind me telling you that he has uh, just discovered that he's getting worried now. He's just discovered the joys of uh, of a Haynes manual. Uh, Some of you will know what a Haynes manual is. Some of you won't. Um, There's a Haynes manual. (laughs) Is that the one you've got? Is that the one? This is the uh, Haynes manual for a VW transporter, and uh, I think owners of, uh, of such uh, cars and vans of a certain age uh, will find a Haynes manual very useful, because um, you can find a Haynes manual for just about any uh, motorbike or car, uh, jet ski, just about anything you've got, you can find a Haynes manual for it. And they'll tell you how it's sort of put together, uh, hopefully, so you can maintain it, repair it, and, uh, and get it going again. And because it's uh, such a successful brand, they obviously... Uh, wondered about manuals for other things so I'm not making this up this is on their website you can get a Haynes manual for the International Space Station you would hope they wouldn't need a Haynes manual for that but uh, um, you can also get one for uh, apparently I don't know how good that is somebody else can tell us about that one for one for our congregation here maybe (laughs) they haven't photoshopped these you can really buy these on their website Um, and even the, uh, the DeLorean time machine from Back to the Future, apparently. So um, you can get all sorts of things. Now, I think, uh, I think someone at Haynes got a little bit carried away with the idea that they'd got. They'd fixed on this idea, and uh, they just ran with it. But um, as, as we've witnessed uh, Jemima's baptism today, I want to turn your attention now for a few minutes to a kind of, it's not really a Haynes manual, but a kind of description, an explanation of what it means to be a Christian. It's not quite step by step like you might find in one of these manuals, but it's, it's a kind of summary, it's a kind of encapsulation of what it means, what it means when someone says, I'm a Christian. If they mean it in the biblical sense, in what the Bible understands and what the Bible teaches, this is what it means. And in these, just these first 10 verses of Ephesians 2, you have, you have this kind of explanation uh, of what it means to be a Christian. Paul is writing to um, a church, a church in Ephesus, uh, many years after he had been part of planting that church and starting that church. He'd been there at the beginning, and uh, now many years later he's writing to that church again to encourage them. And uh, he's reminding them for their encouragement of uh, what he preached to them, the gospel, the good news that he preached to them when he was there. And so these verses are a great explanation of what it means to be a Christian. I, um, I settled on these verses and started reading a bit about them and I found um, there, are, there is some thought that these may have even been used as a kind of baptismal formula um, in the church, that people may have gone through these or may have used these to explain what they were doing. And so they're a great help to us. Now, baptism is a great time to hear someone's story and here Paul is telling the story really of every Christian um, because he gets to the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's not, it's not quite Haynes' manual step by step, but it's a good summary of it. it gets to the heart of it. it says something fundamental about uh, what has happened to someone who comes to faith in Jesus, as Jemima has testified today, and others of you are in the same way. So let me tell you just uh, four things. I'm not going to be able so long this morning, but I want to tell you just four things that Paul tells us here are true of every person that God has brought to new life uh, in Jesus. Here's the first thing. Uh, from the first verse once dead in sin that's what he says of Christians once we were you were dead in sin first verse uh, one of chapter two as for you he says you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air before Paul gets to what is overwhelmingly good news just what Jesus has done for us he needs to make clear the devastatingly bad news uh, of uh, the way this world is. Um, Why we need help in the first place, why we even need Jesus in the first place. And what he says here is, in one way, it's quite dark, it's quite depressing, but it is realistic of the way the world is. There was a time, wasn't there, you can read it in history books, when people thought we were sort of heading as a, as a, as a world and as a planet to, towards a kind of utopia where everything would be great. And uh, every, everything would be fine, and all our problems would be dealt with with technology, and we were just headed upwards. And then there were, you know, then there were two great wars that rocked the whole world and showed us just the reality of, of our human condition. The good news of the Christian message, it is the best news, is that it's good news, but first we must, it must show us our condition. And it's, not, and it's not easy to hear, to be honest. It's not that pleasant. Because the Bible here, and in many of the places, tells us that we are not born 
good and then some go bad and some don't neither are we kind of born neutral so that you know we have a choice and we have free choice whether we whether we go good or bad it tells us that we are spiritually dead which is not an easy thing to hear or a very pleasant thing and it and it is it is so because the representative head of our whole family adam at the very beginning sinned and turned away from god and we all follow him we're not sinners because at some point we chose to do wrong we choose it because our hearts are sinful because we are sinners from the start so we are dead in transgressions and sins transgressions is kind of the idea of kind of crossing the line going where you're not supposed to trespassing so there's a sort of active side to that and sins is kind of missing the mark and falling short of a standard and it's a kind of more you know you didn't do what you should have done and so before god we are all Someone said we're all rebels and failures. Um, and this is where we all walk naturally. It wasn't meant to be like this. God made the world good. But this is where we are now. Following a, a world system that is opposed to God. And we have an influence from God's enemy, the devil, who is mentioned here. And uh, I found one author. This is a guy called John Stott. <coughs> Some of you all have heard of him. And he put it like this. So then, before... Sorry. Yes, that's right. So then, before Jesus Christ sets us free, we were subject to oppressive influences from both within and without. Outside was the world, the prevailing secular culture. Inside was the flesh, our fallen nature, twisted with self-centeredness. And beyond both, actively working through both, was that evil spirit, the devil, the ruler of the kingdom of darkness, who held us in captivity. That's what Paul says here. One time, dead in our sins, following this way, uh, in, in, under the influence of, of this... Uh, of this uh, against God, anti-God uh, spirit who is the devil now thankfully that isn't the end of the story if it was then there wouldn't be much good news here today would there, but it is where we must start and it might look in verse 1 as if Paul is kind of pointing the finger at his readers and saying as for you over there, you know, not me but he's, that's not what he's saying he's talking about Jews and Gentiles and uh, there is a difference there but he was using that distinction and further on he says all of us verse 3 all of us also lived among at one time all of us were like this he's not uh, pointing the finger at anyone here all of us walked in this way serving our sinful natures following his desires and thoughts and that makes us the the the, the target rightly so of God's just and righteous wrath his his settled opposition to everything that ruins the good creation that he made that's where we are we're all sinners before God and pretty quickly in our lives we show that don't we we show our true nature no one teaches children do they to do the things that they do that uh, that uh, make us sad no one teaches them to lie or to hurt others or to be selfish it's just part of our fallen nature and it comes out we see it why is it that we can't live you know in a just world uh, fairly sharing our resources why can't we just look out for one another that you know you hear that that call sometimes don't you why can't we just get on with each other now why is it that we need to lock our cars and lock our houses why does our country need armies and weapons of war why do we need the police because humankind i would argue from the bible has this deep-seated problem and it's that we are spiritually and morally dead and that's a pretty gloomy thought isn't it for what is a joyful day but it is the darkness that shows the glory of the light because unless you hear this bad news first, you may be tempted to think, well, Jesus is just for, for kind of weak people, you know, we need a bit of a crutch in life, or that faith, some people I've heard say, well, faith is nice if you've got it, you know, it's good for you, but um, maybe it's just for you and not for me. Or maybe you feel that as a race, we are still headed upward and we can work it out. I don't know if that's your hope for the situation in Ukraine, that maybe we'll just all get along. It doesn't work like that, does it? We know it's, it's not like that. There is a remedy for us, in, but our only hope is not within ourselves, it's with our gracious God. So, once, uh, once dead in our sin. Secondly, secondly, Paul says, but saved by grace. Saved by grace. The problem is not just that we need a kind of slight fix, a bit of help, a spiritual boost, a leg up. Our human problem is death. It's death. But God is the author of life. He's the source of life. And uh, verse 4 to 5 uh, 4 and 5 is good news for us. Here's what it says. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace, grace you have been saved. Once dead, but saved by grace. Secondly, our God is a God of great love. He's always been so. Even before there was ever any of us to love, 
he was a God of love. I, I can't explain the Christian doctrine of the tri-unity of God, the trinity of God to you very well. But it is all over the Bible that God is one and yet three. So God didn't make us because he was kind of lonely and needed some company. In, in his being and his nature, he is a God of love, it, essentially. The Father loving the Son in the power of the Spirit, the three in a relationship of love. And that love is a giving, sharing love. So that even, even though we are rebels and failures, because of his great love, God can make people alive who once were dead. And God showed his love to us by not just leaving us to his judgment, which he could have done. He would have been utterly righteous to do so. But he stepped in to show us mercy. Mercy is uh, not, not giving us what we truly deserve. Not long until Christmas now, is it? I don't know how many days it is, but it's not very long. And we'll remember again the amazing truth of God stepping into his creation, coming himself here in the person of the Lord Jesus, taking on, really taking on our humanity, joining himself to it, and doing that to save us. Baptism is a great picture of being dead in sin, but now alive in Jesus, raised to new life. And as we said earlier, if we're, if you're, if we're trusting in Christ and what he did for us, we're joined in union with him. So when he dies, and he really did, we die with him. And when he rises, and he really did, we rise too. And when he is seated in glory, as Paul goes on to say here, we will join him. And that's what verse uh, 6 means. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That doesn't mean, you know, when you become a Christian, we're sort of transported uh, directly to heaven. But it means that's where we are, that's where our place is now. We, we, uh, we're still here, but our lives are joined to his life. And so our hope is with him. I don't know if you watched um, the Queen's funeral service, but if you did, you would have heard these words read out. These were, the, um, these were in the first lesson that was read by Baron of Scotland, I think. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter is great, great to read, but here's what it says at the end. Uh, Paul the, the writer there is talking about how our, how our bodies will be changed in the end, how our hope is not of you know, not of just being on the clouds or something but our hope is of being raised and he says when the perishable, that's what we've got now has been clothed with the imperishable, what God is going to ra raise us to and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory and he quotes this little bit of poetry, where death is your victory, where death is your sting the sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That was the, that was the Queen's hope, as, uh, as she made clear lots of times in lots of ways, and, and it's the hope of every Christian trusting Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. He gives us the victory. Not we, we give ourselves the victory, but he gives us it through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all of his, uh, all of his, faith, his undeserved favour. That's what grace is. It isn't earned by anything we do. Verse 9 tells us that. Not by works. We're not saved by the things we do, but by the things that Christ has done. New life in Jesus is all of his grace. So it's not earned by anything you've done or can do, which is bad news for our pride, isn't it? Because we, we, we kind of like to help ourselves, don't we? We like to say, didn't I, didn't I do well there? And feel we can do it on our own. And no one really likes accepting or needing charity, do they, honestly? But it's great news for all sinners, all helpless, dead sinners. Jesus is the great friend of sinners, those who fail, those who've rejected him, those who tried to sort themselves out and have failed. He is the friend of that kind of person. So there's nothing you can do to save yourself, but there's nothing you need to do because he has done it for you. So you need to just come to him. Once dead in sin, but saved by grace. Thirdly, saved by grace, but Paul says, through faith. For it is by grace you've been saved, verse eight, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Through faith. Faith is, if you like, if you want a picture, it's like the hands that reach out and take God's gift of life. Um, how do you define faith? That might seem like a, a vague thing. Maybe you've, maybe you've heard people try and define it. Maybe it's just a thing which is a bit, a bit wishy-washy to you. Maybe it's just a belief system. You know, I have, I have a faith. It means these are the things that I believe. Or maybe just positive thinking, you know, have faith. Uh, it just means sort of, you know, trust that it'll all go well. But the Bible is clearer than that. It involves uh, knowledge of who Jesus is and what he's done. So it involves knowing something about 
what Jesus has done, which is why we spend a lot of time at the church here, opening the Bible and explaining what it means and trying our best to understand it as well as we can. We don't just, we don't just sit and, and sort of pray and think or reflect and be in silence. We try and study and we try and learn. So it involves knowledge, but it needs more than that because you could be the best scholar of the Bible and still not know Jesus. Faith is, is more than just knowledge, but it's also approving or agreeing to what we know. Um, it's hearing the truth and giving assent to it and saying, yes, this is true and this is right. But it's more than that too. It's a step further. It's knowing it and it's agreeing with it and then it's, it's trusting him. It's believing it. it's personal trust in the one that we know and that we agree with. And that faith that saves is trust in Jesus Christ as a living person for the forgiveness of sins. Trusting that what he did on the cross was for us and for uh, the eternal life that he brings us. And so faith in effect says, I understand what Jesus has done for me and that I need his forgiveness as a sinner and I agree that his judgment is right and that without him I'm condemned and I ask him to save me and make me new and I trust in him and all that he did on the cross to pay for my sin and make me right with God. And apart from that, I've got no hope. That's what faith says. And Paul says something a bit surprising here in verse 8, but we believe it to be true. He says, um, it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And then he says, sort of in brackets, and this not from yourselves is the gift of God not by works so that no one can boast so even this kind of faith even this holding out our hands to receive the gift is not is not kind of some merit for us it's not that we say well we did the right thing God, God reward us because we've we've had faith now even the faith to believe is a gift dead people don't raise themselves do they when God is at work he he brings faith it's a gift to us as well and so that we have no boast before him we sometimes struggle a bit, don't we, with baptism uh, services to know what to say to the person who's baptised. Sort of, we want to say kind of congratulations, but it's not really congratulations, is it? Because the whole point is not to lift up the person and say, "Well, didn't they do a good thing?" We're saying, "Isn't isn't Jesus a good saviour?" You can say congratulations; it's fine. But you know what I mean. It, we, it, it's not that we are. It's not that we are applauding that even as as some kind of work or merit. No, there's no boast for us because Jesus has done it all. Um, you can know the same forgiveness and the same peace with God if you come to Jesus and trust him for yourself this morning. Uh, Jemima has testified that he saved her, and if her and if others here, then, then why not you this morning? Once, once dead in sin, but saved by grace through faith, for for something for good works he says at the very end for your god's workmanship created in christ jesus to do good works which god prepared in advance for us to do here's a challenge really for all those who who say they are christians who profess to follow the lord jesus paul says clearly that we are not saved and made right with god by our good works in other words you can't work your way into god's good books it doesn't work like that everything we do is 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 affected and broken by sin and so without, without God's intervention, we are kind of like kids, you know, when you give them chocolate and they, if they try and clean anything with their chocolatey hands, they get everything covered. Everything we, we, we touch, we, we stain because of our sin. It's only by God's grace and his kindness, only through faith and trust in him, that anyone can be forgiven and saved and joined to the Lord Jesus. But that doesn't mean that Christians can then just kind of live as they please. It doesn't mean, well, we've got, our, we've got our ticket to heaven and now we can just live as if yeah, God wasn't there. We can just enjoy life without any consequences. That's, that's not how it is. The Bible tells a different story. It is that a heart and a soul and a life that God has saved is now different, is now transformed. So that the things you wanted to do once, you no longer want to do. You no, long, lo no longer want to live for self and you know, and, and bigger ourselves up. We no longer love the things we once did. Our priorities have changed. We have a new master, a new Lord. And so we're not saved by our good works, but we are saved for those good works, to live like Jesus did. What was it that characterized Jesus' life? If, you, if you'd met him you know, when he was on this earth, what would you have come away seeing? Well, you'd have seen all kinds of things, but you'd, you'd certainly have seen self-sacrificial love, wouldn't you? You'd have seen self-giving. You'd have seen Jesus's priorities that were not for himself. He didn't amass uh, great riches. He didn't uh, amass a, 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 a property or wealth of any kind. 
he gave, he gave. And, it, and of course, at the cross, he gave his life. Jesus says, good trees produce good fruit. They, they can't help it. It's just, what, it's just what good trees do, what life does. And so here's the challenge for us, um, that we are saved for good works as Christians. We're not zapped to a kind of sinless perfection where we never do anything wrong again. Our old nature will pull us away from doing this, but God made us alive with Jesus to do good works, to live out our faith. In the book of James in the Bible, James is pretty bold and he says, look, if you say if you, say you have faith and there are no works in your life, there's no evidence of it, well, then he says, you're mistaken. You haven't got faith at all. Because faith will show itself. If you trust God and if you know new life in him, it will show itself. It can't help it. You know, if you were taken to court for being Christian, would there be enough evidence? That was the old saying, wasn't it? Would there be enough evidence to convict you if somebody wanted to look at your life and see? Well, we are saved by grace through faith for, for good works, to live as Jesus did. All of us are dead in sin, but through Jesus, we can be saved by his grace through faith and trust in him. And we can be brought to a new life. God can change our hearts. He can transform us so that we live now not to please ourselves, but to please him. We all one day will give an account, won't we, before God? He, he excludes none from this life. There's no caveat here to say, but not you, not, not that person. The invitation is to all. So let me, let me finish with this invitation. This is uh, some words of the Lord Jesus himself. If you've heard and listened today to all that has been done for you uh, in Jesus, all that he has done, and you want to know this faith uh, that Jemima has spoken about and that we've talked about, then, then hear Jesus' call in these words. These are... Uh, words from Matthew 11 Jesus says come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light there's the, the call again of the gospel of the good news Jesus says come come and I'll give you rest rest from all you're striving to find satisfaction in, in other things in the wrong things uh, I'll give you rest I'll give you peace um, You'll find rest for your souls, not just, not just here and now, but for all eternity. And he says, there is a yoke, there is a, a burden, but it's easy and it's light in following him. Well, thanks for listening and uh, trust those uh, words will be an encouragement to us. Let me just uh, pray and then we'll sing our final hymn together. Oh Lord God, we thank you for your word and for how clear it is to us, Lord, of what it means to, to be a follower of Jesus. And we thank you that, Lord, you have done a, a great thing for us, an amazing thing. Lord, that you've taken the sin which would condemn us to hell and you've dealt with it in the person of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he died on the cross for us and as he rose again. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, if we uh, come and uh, trust him and have faith in him, we, we've, we will find, Lord, that uh, we died with him in his death to an old way of life and it, it's, we can be raised to a new life with him. And Lord, to know his presence with us now and for all eternity as well. Lord, we thank you for uh, these things. We pray that, Lord, you'd uh, encourage us with them and help us to think further on them, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.